Freya? always you, Allison. It sucks it turned out this way. That's it. It's over. Get on the ground. I'm sorry about this. Get on the ground! <laughs> Relatively speaking, you? Tired, but optimistic. What's up? I'm so burnt. I just have to sit here and eat this whole thing of ice cream. No, I understand. Where's Will? I don't know. Hi, Miss Bristow. It's Mary Beth from Director Kendall's office. I've got him for you, so give us a call. Will said he had something to do. change out of these clothes.
Hello. I'm Andy Dufresne. The wife, Helen Baker. How do you know that? Keep my head to the ground. Why'd you do it? I didn't, since you asked. Hell, uh, you'll fit right in then. Everyone's innocent here. Don't you know that? What else have you heard? People say you're a cold fish. They say you think your shit smells sweeter than ordinary. That true? I don't know, what do you think? Ain't made up my mind yet. I understand that you're the type of man who knows how to get things. I know to locate things from time to time. They just seem to fall right into my hands. I was wondering if you could give me a, a rock hammer. What is it? And why? Do you always make your customers' motives a part of your business? <laughs> if you wanted a toothbrush, I wouldn't ask questions. Just quote the price. See, a toothbrush is a non-lethal sort of object. Okay, fair enough. Rock hammer is, um, what is it? It's a song. It's a little miniature pickaxe. It's eight or nine inches long. It's got a small, sharp pick on one end and a, a blunt hammerhead on the other. It's, it's for rocks. Rocks? Yeah. It's for rocks. Quartz? Yeah, quartz, sure. You got mica, shale, uh, silted granite, a little bit of limestone from when they cut this place out of the hill. So... I'm just a rock hound. Uh, at least I was in my old life. I'd like to be again, at least in some limited scale. Yeah, that or plant your toy in somebody's skull. I don't have any enemies here, man. No? <laughs> just wait. Where it goes around that decisions have taken a real shine into you. Especially bugs. Tell me something. Would it help if I, you know, explain to them that I'm not homosexual? Neither are they. Look, you gotta be human first. They don't qualify. Bull queers, they, they take by force. That's all they want. That's all they understand. I'd grow eyes in the back of my head if I were you. Thanks for the advice. That comes free. But you understand my concern? If there's trouble, I doubt a rock hammer would do any good. Then I guess you're trying to escape? Tunnel under the wall, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. You'll know when you see the rock hammer. What's this item usually go for? Seven dollars at any rock and gem shop? Standard markup is usually 20%. But we're talking about a special object here. Risk goes up, price goes up. We'll call it, we'll call it 10 even. 10 it is. I see what I can do. <laughs> but it's a waste of money. How's that? People who run this place, they love surprise inspections. <laughs> they turn a blind eye to certain things, but not to an object like that. They'll find it, and they'll take it. Mention my name, we'll never do business again. Not for a pair of shoelaces or a stick of gum. I understand. Um, thanks, Mr. Uh... Red. Name's Red. I'm Andy. Pleasure doing business with you.
surprise. Whoa. Is this your room? It's cool. Thanks. You got me a gift. After all that help on my Penn State application? Of course I did. Open it. Wow, I, I don't even know what to say. You don't have to say anything. I'm sorry we can't be here for your birthday. Um, that's okay. I'm, I'm just sorry I have to go back and, you know, visit your dad. Yeah, I'm in such a great mood. I don't even think he could ruin it. I just feel like I'm finally doing good. Well, y you are. Me? What about you? When I met you, you were this scared freshman and Look at you in that suit. You look like a sexy English schoolboy. I saw Mary Elizabeth checking you out. <laughs> Stop. Innocence. Worst kind of guy. Never see you coming and parents love you. That's like extra danger. <laughs> well, it hasn't worked out for me so far. Come on. You've never had a girlfriend? Not even a second grade Valentine. Have you ever kissed a girl? No. Have you? Have I ever kissed a girl? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I mean, your first kiss. Um my first kiss. Um, I was 11. His name was Robert and he would come over to the house all the time. Was he your first boyfriend? He was my dad's boss. Look, Charlie, I used to sleep with guys who treated me like shit and get wasted all the time, but now I feel like I have a chance. I could get into a real college. It's true. I mean, you can do it. My aunt, my aunt had the same thing happen to her and she turned her whole life around. She must have been great. She was my favorite person in the whole world. Until now. Charlie, I know you know I like Craig. But I wanna forget about that for a minute, okay? I just want the first person who kisses you to love you. I love you, Charlie. I love you too.
is up. Today we're going to talk about how technological determinism can be used to justify technological advancements with negative consequences, and how the season 4 finale of Black Mirror, Black Museum, reflects this. Technological determinism, an idea thought to have originated from Thorstein Veblen, claims that culture and society is determined by, or at the very least influenced by, technological innovations. And it isn't technological determinism. Ray Kurzweil's Law of Accelerating Returns, an extension of Moore's Law, states that human innovation, be it evolution or technological innovation, increases at an exponential rate. Basically, the Law of Accelerating Returns states that technological innovation is inevitable, and technological determinism claims that technology is a cause, not an effect. So, according to these schools of thought, technology is inevitable, and it is no one's fault. Therefore, any technological advancement, regardless of negative consequences, is justifiable. In the episode Black Museum, the two main characters, Rolo Haynes and Nish, represent those who agree with ideas of technological determinism and those who don't, respectively. Rolo runs a museum that houses relics of technology gone wrong, and the main attraction is the holographic consciousness of Nish's father, who became brain dead after he was exposed to the experience of an electric chair for too long. Nish does not feel that the technology is justified and holds Rolo accountable for what happened. Rolo, on the other hand, expresses his belief that technology will move forward inevitably. He is involved in several stories in which he brings a new technology to someone, and it ruins their life. Each time the technology gets more advanced, his innovation improves, and each time he moves on with little consequences. Some of the technologies are also shown to shape the universe of Black Mirror, such as the downloading of consciousness, which is used in the episode Shenji Naparo. The technology reshapes the way death is thought about and what it means. The technology reshapes the culture, as predicted by technological determinism. Rolo represents the inevitability of technology in a technological determinist viewpoint. And Nish represents the flaws in this viewpoint and the pain she suffers at the hands of Rolo. What is up? Today we're going to have a discussion about Orientalism, specifically what it means and its use in the 1984 film Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. While Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is far from the only film that contains elements of Orientalism, it is rife with examples and will serve the purposes of our discussion well. Now first things first, what exactly is Orientalism? Orientalism is a conglomeration of North African, Middle Eastern, and Eastern and Southern Asian stereotypes that make up a false perspective held by Western countries about the culture and everyday life of these regions. This perspective characterizes the Orient as magical, sexual, hedonistic, and barbaric. Other important elements are the assertions that the Orient is antiquated and inferior to the West. Edward Said stating in an interview that there is a kind of image of the timeless Orient, as if the Orient, unlike the West, doesn't develop. It stays the same. And Naomi Rosenblatt discussing binary logic that does not set the East and West on equal footing, but is said pins the two against one another in order to highlight the colonial superiority of the Occident over the Orient. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom displays these ideas immediately in the opening of the film, first with a dance sequence that associates traditional Asian garb such as sage hats and folding fans with hedonistic and sexual ideas. Additionally, in the scene, the Chinese gang is depicted as violent and dishonest, highlighting Western ideas of barbarism in the East. Later on in the film, ideas about magic are introduced as Indiana interacts with Indian villagers and a dangerous cult that worships Jesus' magical objects, while ideas about hedonism are explored in the opulent palace of the Maharaja and ideas about barbarism are explored in the outrageous meal served to the guests of the palace and in the violence and cruelty of the cult. Lastly, elements of antiquation and inferiority are explored in one of the final scenes when the cult, wielding bow and arrows and dressed in traditional garb, are fought off by the British Indian Army who wield more advanced rifles that ultimately overpower the cult. 